All right. Well, welcome, everybody, uh, to our webinar presentation today uh, on the mend from burnout strategies and prevention. Um, and uh, we have a, a great uh, guest uh, presenter today. Um, my name is Matt McBride. I am the co-founder of MEND. We also have uh, Brooke on our marketing team that'll be assisting us a little bit here today behind the scenes. And then we have our amazing presenter, Gabrielle, who is uh, an entrepreneur, licensed clinical social worker for 10 years, and now a consultant helping uh, healthcare organizations from topics we're discussing today to billing and, and other types of matter. So uh, Gabrielle, uh, welcome and thank you for presenting today. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to speak with everybody about this. Awesome. Um, so uh, just to jump into the agenda here, uh, we're going to uh, really kind of define uh, burnout, uh, talk about measuring it and, and other, uh, you know, uh, factors of what can cause it, detecting it, so on and so forth, and then look at some potential solutions. And then finally, uh, we'll end and have a little bit of time for Q&A. So uh, we will give everybody a heads up as we're getting near the end of the presentation. But if you think of a question throughout the presentation today, you can hit the Q&A uh, button at uh, the bottom of the Zoom toolbar and you can put in your questions and then we'll address those at the end. Oh, there's the uh, agenda slide there. Um, so to jump into the presentation, Gabrielle, um, I know everybody's looking forward to it today. Um, and we all probably think we have some sort of understanding of, of, of burnout, but can you help define it for us today? So what I hear quite often now, um, first of all, obviously burnout is pretty pervasive given what's been happening in the world the past couple of years. But people use this term interchangeably with stress a lot. I hear that like, I'm so burnt out, I'm so tired, I'm so overwhelmed. And stress and burnout are two completely different things, although they're, they're besties and they hang out together. But burnout is past the point of stress. It is mental and physical exhaustion. It's caused by chronic stress, but it's basically long-term unresolved stress. So there is a difference there, and it does impact all, or it can impact all different areas of your life, but it is different than stress. And, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of interesting because I, you know, have always kind of, uh, you know, being a founder and men, I knew it was going to be a lot of work. I had a plan to manage stress. Uh, hadn't really thought of or considered the word, you know, the word burnout at all, or really thought about that. So just kind of curious on how these two concepts, you know, connect and how they differ. So like I said, they're besties, they hang out together, but I think of stress as being too much and burnout is not enough. So if you have ever been burnt out or if you have worked for somebody who's burnt out, they are that person that is probably pretty negative. You're very numb. There's a deep sense of disillusionment, very blunted emotions, and just kind of a loss of hope. So you're just more apathetic, whereas stress is the anxiety, the hyperactivity, the urgency, a lot of overactive emotions. But they're, as I said, they're besties, they're mutual, mutually reinforcing. So if you have long-term unresolved stress, that will eventually lead to burnout. And it kind of cycles because burnout has a greater impact on your stress. And the more burnt out you are, the more stress you have because you may be missing deadlines or procrastinating or not attending to other areas of your life. 
So they are mutually um, reinforcing. And then I have this little statistic here, which is from 2020. So I can only imagine what it looks like now. Uh, but that was a 2018 survey. So that was even before COVID showing that 40% of these 2000 employees that they surveyed were considering quitting due to burnout. So I know at this point that it has gotten much worse and it is contributing to a lot of the staffing shortages that we're having in the healthcare industry. Um, and, you know, Gabby, some folks, you know, might not even realize that they're stressed out or, or burnt out. So, or, or, you know, maybe even the colleagues or, you know, folks around them. So what are the warning signs? So this is really important to, um, like you just mentioned with colleagues as well, because if you're in a leadership position, this is really important to pay attention to, not just for you, but for your coworkers or your team or your employees. So some red flags and symptoms that you might notice, um, every day is bad. I know when I was really deep in my own burnout, this was kind of the big obvious thing that was telling me like something needed to change because when I woke up every day, I was like, it's going to be a bad day. I can't do this anymore. And that helped me make changes in my own life to get to where I'm at now. Um, you might feel there's a lot of physical symptoms too. So you might feel exhausted, apathetic. Again, this was a big one for me. And that was another big red flag because at that point I was a therapist. And so obviously it was my job, right, to care about my clients, but I was feeling so burnt out and numb and overwhelmed that I was like, I don't, I don't really care what happens today. I don't care what happens with my business or with my team. I just want to get this over with. And of course that can lead to reduced performance or isolation or alienating yourself from your team or your family or your friends. Yeah, I could see that being difficult you almost need to take care of yourself <laughs> before you could you could take care of other people um but let's see here moving on i know you've got a, a few more red flags and, and symptoms to take us through so i wanted to highlight this because we might think of this just more of an emotional thing but and we'll talk more about this later i do want to highlight that there are physical emotional and behavioral changes and those might look like um, getting sick a lot and not being able to get better. That was another thing that I dealt with in the past um, in a previous job. You might have sleep issues, a change in appetite, again, feeling drained or just really tired and fatigued, muscle pain. So those are physical symptoms. And then emotionally, it looks like, again, helplessness, failure, a net really negative outlook, being detached or defeated, and not a lot of motivation. And behaviorally, this is another one that's really important for leadership to look at too, because you'll be able to notice these changes in your team, right? So if somebody who always came to work on time, meets their deadlines, is now leaving work early or coming late or procrastinating, even coping with substances, or you notice that they're withdrawing or isolating themselves from the team, then those are some other warning signs that maybe something else is going on. Um, <clears throat> well, I can definitely relate to a lot of the items uh, on this on this slide. Um, you know, like heavy workload, long hours, boundaries, uh, to name a few here. Um, but uh, can you in interpret some of these uh, risk factors for us? Yes. So some of these might seem a little bit obvious, right? But what I notice what happens when I'm doing consulting or these trainings with people is that there are a lot of these risk factors and we're not slowing down and paying attention to them. And then over time, that is going to lead to burnout. So burnout does not happen overnight. It happens over time. And even though sometimes you just might wake up one day and be like, wow, I hate this right now, there have been risk factors and red flags that would or have been giving you information to slow down, to pay attention, to make changes in your life. And a lot of the risk factors here are uh, ones that we see in healthcare. 
So you have a heavy workload and you work long hours. I know as a social worker, that was just kind of how I thought the job was supposed to be. Um, but I was working in child protective services. And I know that's probably no surprise to anybody on this call that I got burnt out working in that job. And that was part of it. We had a really heavy workload and we worked really long hours. And that also in turn made me struggle with work-life balance because everybody around me uh, in the team that I was working with and the agency that I was working at also struggled with work-life balance because that was kind of the culture that was shown to me. So everybody had their work cell phones on 24 seven, answering calls on the weekends, things like that. If you work in a helping profession, you're also at a higher risk for being burnt out. So burnout was actually coined in the 70s by a psychologist because of working people who are working in the helping profession. So we were the ones that coined that term, yay us, but now of course it has a bigger, broader meaning. meaning. Um, if you feel like you have little or no control over your work, that's also going could lead to burnout um, that, you know, feels inauthentic or if you feel like you can't do what you enjoy doing, of course, that's going to lead to you getting burnt out. Also, the lack of support. This is really important too. as human beings, we are meant for connection. So if you don't have support on your teams or if you work in silos, that can make you feel very disconnected and isolated. Poor boundaries. This is something that comes up with every single client that I do consulting with. Boundaries are huge. And in the helping profession and in the healthcare field, because there is so much what I like to call like heart work, we want to help and we want to do things. There's a lot of people pleasing. When we're people pleasing and we're saying yes, and we meant to say no, we have poor boundaries. Or if you, again, don't have the support that you need or the communication that you need or the tools that you need to do your job really well, you might also have poor boundaries. And finally, values differences. Um, when I do this training in a longer format, because I have options to do this for four hours, like we are just kind of scratching the surface today, we talk really deeply about values. And this is important because this is your purpose. This is what guides you and what leads you. So uh, it's really important to think about your own personal values and then the values of your company or your agency. And even if you are somebody who is self-employed, your company, your business should have its own set of values as well. And what I like to do is to sit down and write down the personal values and the business values and making sure that they align. And sometimes they are a little bit different and that's okay. But when there's too big of a difference, I mean, think about that. That means you're working 40 hours a week, maybe more doing something that has no meaning for you. So that can also lead to burnout. Well, that was really kind of interesting too to be if you're in that situation too you, you for you you had all these kids that needed help you've got a a, a work oh everybody's got a big case load everybody's working long hours this is the culture it's almost like well this is just this is normal this is just what normal is but no that's that's what uh burnout <laughs> like sort of le 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 leads to burnout but people might not you know might not really have any idea they might just think oh well this is just uh how i need to be how, this is how everybody else is but um so then uh moving along here then uh, maybe take us through some of the causes so there are a lot of causes i'm going to talk about a couple of them a little bit more in depth but your personality type can be a cause for that as i mentioned conflicting values can be a cause for burnout uh, so if you are, again, working 40 hours a week in a job where the values are completely different from your personal values, that might not feel meaningful to you. Your workload, again, that's probably pretty obvious. If your workload is too high and you're working too much, again, that perceived um, or actual <laughs> lack of control over your job. This is another one that I felt when I was working in child welfare because I didn't have a lot of control over what happened. There were things that were very important life changes to people like 
terminating parental rights that I had absolutely no control over. It was the court system, it was the legal system, and I just had to be the one who took the brunt of it. Um, community. So again, you want to have that community at work, you want to feel supported at work, which ties into feeling appreciated. If you work 40 hours a week and nobody ever says thank you, that doesn't feel good. I was just talking to um, a consulting client about this. She said that she's been working where she's at for five years and she has been nominated for employee of the month a couple times and she's never gotten it. And meanwhile, somebody else on her team who's been there for six months just got employee of the month. So it was just one of those things, right? Like it probably wasn't on purpose, but slowing down and paying attention to that as a leader, like, hey, you know, Matt's been on the team for 10 years. Maybe we should recognize him and thank him. And when I owned my group practice, this was something that I took very seriously as well, because again, our, our jobs are difficult and I wanted my therapist to feel appreciated. So I would just do little things like get them a Starbucks gift card or or, you know, send all of them because we were working remotely a DoorDash gift card and say lunch is on me today. Just little things that, you know, let your team know like, hey, I am thinking about you and we appreciate you. Uh, unclear expectations. This is a very big cause of burnout pretty much in every industry anywhere because if you are, if your team does not know what to expect or what their job role is, they don't know what they're doing, right? They have no guidance. Maybe they haven't been onboarded correctly. Um, and so they don't know, what do I need to do here? What is the expectation of answering emails? How much time do I have to respond to this type of communication? Am I supposed to be responding after hours? Other people are responding after hours. Is that what I'm supposed to do? So being really clear about that can help um, prevent burnout on your team. And then again, work-life imbalance, which hopefully <laughs> isn't too big of a problem, but it happens. We see that a lot where, again, poor boundaries and work is bleeding into your personal life. But there are both internal and external factors, which I'll talk about next. Yes, so I know you're going to take us through internal factors, and there's this. This is, uh, you know, sort of that last bullet really stands out to me because, um, you know, I I work a lot, so want to make time for the family, want to make time, to, you know, for stress mitigation and other things, and that really just means that, you know, a social life kind of takes a back seat. So I could definitely uh, connect with with this slide. So. Uh, interested to learn more about the internal factors here. So something that I will share really quickly that helped me with my own burnout because I was the same way, Matt, um, especially when I owned my group practice and I had a team of 15 therapists that worked for me. Um, well, first the people pleasing <laughs> and second, um, I was working too much and I just thought that's the way that it needs to be, right? Like I'm the boss, I have to be there for everybody. But once I slowed down and I actually just wrote down what I wanted my ideal day to look like, that really helped me make my own internal changes to managing my burnout and the people pleasing, the perfectionism. <laughs> so those are some internal factors, right? Those are the things that are us, that we can usually control. Um, but if you are somebody who has really high expectations of yourself, you are a perfectionist, you have a lot of ambition, which again, if you are self-employed, you probably have all of those things. Um, you maybe are somebody who has a strong need for recognition. So you need people to notice you and to validate you. If you're a people pleaser, um, we could do about an eight hour training on people pleasing and burnout. So we don't have that much time today, but it is a really, really big one. Um, if you feel irreplaceable, that's how I felt when I was working in child welfare. And it was also kind of the culture there that um, the admin would tell me like, you can't leave, who's gonna take care of your families? You have such good rapport with them. You're so good at what you do. So I felt irreplaceable. Um, and of course, as soon as I left, they, you know, replaced me probably within a day. <laughs> and this is another one that I see with people who are self-employed also is not wanting or not able to delegate. 
So sometimes you're not able to, but not wanting to is a totally different thing. And as people who are self-employed or who are entrepreneurs, this is a really big one. You think I need to do everything myself. Nobody's going to do it as good as I can, but delegating is key to time management and to making sure you don't burn out. Or, uh, and this kind of goes with the next bullet point too, the hard work and commitment to the point of overestimate overestimation of self and becoming overburdened. So taking on too much, thinking that you can do all of the things when you can't uh, work is your only meaningful activity. So maybe you don't have a social life, you don't have a lot of friends, and that work is really meaningful for you. And I do want to stress here that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, work, a lot of us are very passionate about our work, especially in healthcare. And that's not a bad thing. We want to keep that, but not overdo it to the point where we are burnt out and apathetic and not caring about what we do anymore. Uh, also, if you are somebody who is has a type A personality, or you need to be in control, or you're just kind of somebody that automatically has a negative outlook, which can be changed, you also might be at a higher risk for burning out. And I know those are maybe, you know, they're, they're things that uh, maybe are hard to control or to understand that you have control over the internal factors. But um, I know uh, I really liked how you write out, how you wrote out your ideal day and kind of, uh, you know, put it, kind of put it out there into the, into the universe and then kind of gave yourself maybe a new, a new plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for what you thought, but um, yeah, internal factors. I mean, those seem to be things that that you can kind of control. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I know moving on to uh, external factors. You know, you might have a boss, spouse, uh, other things that maybe are a little more outside of your control. So, would love to get your take on those. Exactly. So. A lot of times, when again, when I'm working with people who are burnt out, we're already in that negative place. And so it can be hard to take a deeper look at what we can do to control it. But a lot of it is within our control. However, a lot of it is with not within our control. So that would be all these external factors. Um, so again, like there's a lack of clarity about your role and what you're supposed to do. Maybe you're not getting any positive feedback. That doesn't feel very good. You might be getting one person on your team to tell you to do something this way. And then another person is telling you it needs to be done this way. There's a lot of demands at work. Again, we see that a lot in healthcare and a lot of other industries too. There's poor teamwork, so you don't feel supported. There's not a lot of social support, uh, not participating. So again, this just makes you feel right, valued and important if you are participating. Um, and that kind of goes with, uh, I think, lack of positive feedback too. So what I will often hear from, you know, more like entry level to mid-level employees is that they, nobody either asks for their feedback or they give it and it's not listened to or integrated. So if you are, you know, in higher level management or leadership, think about that. Ask your team what is working and what's not working. Listen which is harder than it sounds actually. And if possible, integrate that feedback. And if you can't, it can be really helpful to just be transparent about that too. People wanna be heard. So that goes with uh, right to contribute opinions. Again, hopefully making your, um, your office or your agency a safe place for people to be able to voice their opinions safely and feel safe to do so. And a couple other things that are external factors is lack of resources, poor work organization, you have too much responsibility, you have pressure from people above you to get things done in those administrative constraints. But then there's more. It doesn't stop. It doesn't. It doesn't. Doesn't stop there. We, you thought the audience thought we were we were done with external factors, but no, there's more. 
<laughs> they couldn't fit all on one slide, which is probably a problem. But here's some more. I hope that the first one is not happening, but it is out there. And I do hear this again from people that I'm consulting with. It's a bad atmosphere at work. There's bullying. Um, there might be a lack of perceived opportunities for promotion. This is another one that I see a lot as well. And I experienced that too. Um, so that, you know, again, just feeling valued. And even if you can't uh, promote somebody, like something that I did in my group practice, it didn't have the funds to promote people. But what I would do is during our one-on-ones, I would listen to them about what they wanted or you know if we can't promote them now what does growth look like in the future how can i help you get there because maybe it's not something we can do right in this moment but if i know that you do want to you know have a higher up leadership position how can i help you get there um lack of influence on work organizations so again just people feeling like things are unorganized and they don't have any say or control in that if leadership doesn't collaborate with them and then probably one of the biggest ones is poor internal communication and i talked about that a little bit earlier but this is really important how do we know what's happening if we don't know we don't feel valued if there are all these changes happening and nobody's talking to us about it or being transparent about the why that makes me feel like nobody cares about me and with that that brings us to our poll question so uh, we wanted to uh, get the audience engaged here. And so we only have one a poll question uh, today and we're about uh, halfway through the presentation and we'll get to some Q&A. But on a scale of one to five, five being the highest, is burnout affecting your organization? Um, and then you see the options there from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And uh, we'll give everybody a minute to answer. And then uh, Brooke will uh, start the poll and Brooke can... Uh, share some of the results with us. I'll give everyone about a few more seconds here to answer. Okay, I think the um, responses are done coming through here. Um, it looks like 30% of you are saying strongly agree and 40% are saying agree. So it looks like we're leaning more towards the agreed side. Um, Gabrielle, what do you think about these results? Oh, that makes me a little sad, <laughs> but I'm also not surprised. <laughs> and with that, I am really glad that all of you are here and participating in this because there are a lot of changes that we can continue to make because as you see a little bit later, we're gonna talk more deeply about the impact that burnout has on your physical health. And thank you everyone for participating. We appreciate it. And I will go ahead and close out the poll. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so continuing on here, Gabrielle, I, I mean, you, you sort of said it in the beginning, we've all, kind of heard about stress, but, uh, you know, burnout um, is is sort of where things can can lead to. So I had never heard about measuring burnout. So really curious to see what insights you have on that here. Yeah, this is definitely an area or an opportunity for growth, as we all like to say. There really is not a lot of research on it. It is becoming more popular now, I think just because we're speaking about it more and everything that's happened the past couple of years with the great resignation and all of the changes that have happened in our world. But before that, really the biggest one um, was the MBI, which is the Maslow Burnout Inventory. 
And it was, it's 25 questions, um, but it's not very well defined. And there's just really still a lack of high quality controlled studies. Uh, I did just learn about one called the ProQual, which stands for Professional Quality of Life. And it's from the Center for Victims of Torture, which I know sounds pretty awful. But uh, anybody can look at this, they've made it free. So this is something you could do yourself, you could give to your employees um, for more information about burnout um, and compassion fatigue. And it's for anybody who's in like a helping profession or social services, um, teachers, attorneys, any healthcare professional. And if you do wanna check that out, it's I have it listed there, that's how you spell it, and it's .org. So continuing on our journey here, this is where things get a little bit scary because we've sort of talked about, you know, stress and prolonged stress leading to burnout and now maybe even a mental health issue or, or condition. I think that's the, you know, in healthcare, I think that's the last thing you want to see because, you know, as, as a patient, you're going to a healthcare organization to get better and you've got providers, uh, you know, that are they're supposed to, to help people. So I'm definitely uh, curious to learn more here. Yeah, as we know, right, if you are in a depressive episode or if you struggle with depression or anxiety, you're not really in a place to be doing that helping or that heart work, like I said earlier. And so burnout can definitely lead to bigger mental health issues than it has, and I've seen it. And sounds like maybe some of you who answered in the poll that you have seen it also. And if you have ever struggled with your mental health or if you know somebody who has, you probably know that climbing out of that hole of depression or burnout is a lot more difficult than just trying to prevent it in the first place. So that's why I'm really so passionate about this, again, because I've been through it and I, I help people get through it. And there are so many things that we can do to prevent all of this from happening. But burnout can feel more like you know, mental health and it does overlap for sure um, because they both have, or as long with depression anyway, they both have extreme exhaustion, feeling down and then reduced performance. But usually the negative thoughts with burnout are just about work. And when they start to be more pervasive and touch other parts of your life, then that's where we start to think about, okay, maybe this is actually depression. Um, and depression also ha might have suicidal thoughts, hopelessness, and low self-esteem. And burnout is definitely a risk factor to developing depression or anxiety. And I do want to just take a moment here to just remind you if you are struggling with these things or if you know somebody who is or maybe one of your own coworkers or employees that's not normal and life does not have to be that way there are a lot of resources now to be able to access mental health including telemedicine and there are so many different options if you don't have insurance or if you maybe have a high deductible I'll just mention one really quick called Open Path, um, and that is a sliding scale telehealth option for mental health, um, not affiliated with them or anything, but I just like to talk about that because I think sessions start at like $20. So um, with anxiety, which I didn't mention, I just talked about depression, but they also usually <laughs> go together. Uh, and anxiety and emotional exhaustion are really closely correlated too. So work stress, of course, can be a risk factor for getting more of those anxious symptoms. And the more emotionally exhausted, cynical, and less efficient towards work that you feel, then you're gonna have more anxiety about that too. Well, thank you for that. That's a uh, um... I think a, a really important slide in this in this presentation. Um, so moving on to complications from the pandemic and uh, probably uh, all healthcare organizations uh, in the audience today 
and uh, they had the most complications from the pandemic. <laughs> so not only a pandemic, but a uh, great resignation and, uh, you know, folks moving to hybrid work, working from home. Um, so I think healthcare really got hit with it all. So would love to hear your insights uh, on that. For sure. So again, I know it's been a lot the past couple of years from what we've dealt with. And um, again, this could probably be its own training about complications from the pandemic and burnout, but just a couple that I will mention. Obviously, staffing shortages is a really big one, and that's going to lead to burnout, right? Because if you don't have the staff, um, you can't do your job. I mean, even this is a non-healthcare example, but even today I called to make a, an oil change appointment for my car and they don't have anything until the end of April because they don't have any staff. And it's like that everywhere, but it's especially a problem in healthcare because our job here is so important and people's lives are literally in our hands, right? And that makes our jobs more difficult if we don't have the staff to do what we need to do. Um, I did put working from home. Okay, working from home is not a bad thing. Obviously, I work from home. I'm sitting on my couch right now, and I love it. But what happens is this kind of uh, talks about boundaries is how I think of it is it can bleed into your personal life. So, um, you know, you might be working later because it's easier um, or working earlier because it's easier or you're sitting on the couch with your family and you're reading emails when really you should be paying attention to your family. So that just kind of goes along with boundaries. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. It's not good for our eyes. I should have my blue light glasses on, but I don't. <laughs> and uh, so it's just important to take a break, especially if you are on back to back meetings. Um, to get up and move around. My physical therapist says sitting is the new smoking. So make sure you take breaks, edit meetings you don't need. This is advice that I always give when I'm doing consulting about burnout with agencies. Look at your schedule and your meetings and see if instead of having three one hour meetings a week about whatever it is, if you can condense that into one two hour or one 90 minute meeting where you do all of that at once. Um, that way people have more time to work on other tasks. Speaking of tasks, multitasking, which everybody does, even though we know that it is bad. There is tons and tons of research out there that shows that we are not as effective when we multitask, but working from home has made it a lot easier to do that. We're not in an office. Um, you know, I think of like when I used to work in an office and I was in a meeting, I was paying attention to the meeting. I wasn't on my phone, I wasn't in my email. But now that we work from home and we're just on screens, it does make it a little bit easier to do other things. But multitasking is not effective, even if you think it is. And finally, non-business hour communication. I, I feel like we are making a shift from this, but in the beginning of COVID, I was talking to a lot of people who, again, were working from home. So. I'm just going to work on Saturdays and, you know, people responding to emails on the weekends or late at night. So that's just another thing to pay attention to. You know, we uh, implemented no meeting Wednesdays, so yes. it doesn't it, it doesn't always <laughs> get followed. But, you know, we try to give people a break and then, um, you know, for for leaders, uh, you know, there are a lot of tools now where you can schedule communications, right? So, uh, you know, just because something is asynchronous, like email, you think, oh, well, I can send it late. They can just reply in the morning, but then maybe that person assumes, oh, they're they're still working. I need to be working. So, there's a lot of tools to maybe schedule mm -hmm. these things to go to to go to people, so they don't feel like uh, you know they have to work on those hours. So we we've done a lot of those uh, things. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> well, but our next slide here, uh, I, I hadn't, again, hadn't really heard of this, but I think, um, you know, this might help to catch burnout earlier, you know, if you kind of know the the, the stages. So i um, excited to learn about uh, this if you take us through it. Yes, absolutely. So this can totally prevent burnout if you, again, just slow down and pay attention. 
But there are five stages of burnout. And the first one is the honeymoon phase. And ideally, we would all stay here. This is when you first start a job and you are excited and you feel really good and you're happy and you're super productive. And of course, life doesn't always work that way. But what is helpful is maybe if you are in one of these later stages of burnout, you think about the honeymoon phase. What did you enjoy when you first started? What were the good things about that? How can you get back to that? How can you implement those things? But as life happens, you know, you move into the balancing act or the onset of stress. So the excitement kind of wears off. You are getting better at your job. So you might be having more responsibilities now and the stress starts to build. And if you don't change it, then you move into chronic stress, which is again, just more stress, more things on your plate. Um, this is where you might start to see some of those red flags that we had talked about earlier. You might be getting sick more. You might be having sleeping problems, thinking about work all the time. And if those things don't change, you move into burnout. And this is where you start to feel that detachment, that apathy, not caring, procrastinating, using substances to cope. And you can stay here and it'll get worse if things don't change. And when you get to habitual burnout, that's the dark place. It does not feel good. That is where there is just constant stress, um, feeling totally disassociated, feeling detached, numb, apathetic, very negative, and then probably having a lot of physical symptoms like stomach problems, autoimmune disorders, like it has a very big impact on your physical health. Moving on to PVT, I hadn't, uh, you know, again, hadn't really heard of this until I saw your presentation, but, you know, the one thing that kind of stood out to me is the idea of being in these uh, high stress, high beta states, and or just sort of being in that almost fight or flight type of state for, for a long period of time. That almost seemed like uh, uh, that's uh, what what this was uh, about, but is, is that is that a little bit of what's happening if you're burned out? Are you kind of in that long, in these sort of long cycles of this fight or flight state? It is similar. So I I'm so excited to talk about this. Like this is another thing I could talk about for eight hours, and I do have a separate training just on polyvagal theory, but. Why I talk about this is because when I read about burnout or I hear people speak about it, nobody really talks about the why. It's just like, oh, here are these things, but nobody talks about it and goes deeper. And why this is important is because this has to do with our nervous system and you all have one and Matt has one and Brooke has one. We all have a nervous system. Your mom has one, your boss does, and we are all responding to each other. And so this makes such a big difference because honestly, this is something that changed my life when I understood why I was responding the way that I was. Um, and so there's something called polyvagal theory, which is getting more and more traction, which is great. It was created by a psychiatrist um, named Dr. Stephen Porges. And it talks about our vagus nerve, which again, we all have one. And this is the uh, biggest part of our autonomic or automatic nervous system. It comes out uh, the back of our head and it touches a lot of different organs in our body. And it also, again, is automatic nervous system. So it does a lot of um, automatic things that our body does. It's responsible for like our breathing, uh, our heart rate and our digestion. And it is also, again, responding to our environment. 80% of what we're taking in emotionally and physically is from our vagus nerve. And since we all know now that you really like talking about this, you got, you, <laughs> you, we'll, we'll let you continue on here. So um, let me just give you a little bit more information. And then in the next slide, I can kind of walk you through what it looks like. But I'm sure a lot of you have heard of being in fight or flight. And that is what this is about. So um, 
we have three stages and again i'll show you that in the next slide but when we are stressed that's when we are in our fight or flight and you probably know what that feels like and when you are in fight or flight or the third stage which is called freeze you cannot be empathetic or curious or make good decisions you cannot you probably think that you can but what is happening inside is that your frontal lobes of your brain which make those good decisions are completely offline and your amygdala uh, which sometimes people call like your lizard brain or your reptile brain is sensing fear and anxiety and it's making decisions based on that so when you are stressed you're in fight or flight when you're burnt out you are in freeze and what's happening inside of you is not just how you're feeling, but your body is also managing this by um, regulating your hormones. And so if you are in fight or flight, you probably might know this too, that cortisol, adrenaline, all kinds of hormones are being dumped through your bloodstream. And when that happens, you have chronic inflammation. We also, again, probably know what happens when you have chronic inflammation that leads to a lot of health conditions, uh, leads to a lot of autoimmune disorders. And so if you've ever heard of the ACEs study, um, you know, that was looking at people who had trauma in their life and the impact that it had on their physical health. This is why, is because when you have trauma and you're in these stages of your nervous system, there's so much going on physically that leads to health conditions. So that is why I am so super passionate about this because this is something that you do have control over. And understanding this and what I call befriending your nervous system, what makes you relaxed, what pisses you off, that is so important. That is how you regulate your emotions. That is how you can um, be flexible with how you respond to people. And that can really impact your burnout and how you respond to your team, how you respond to your family and how you respond to your environment. And I, I mean, I can definitely relate i had um you know a doctor tell me i was basically you know taxing my adrenal system i was uh overweight pre-diabetic just all of the tired uh, all of these uh you know different things were 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 going on so i can uh, uh definitely uh relate but would love to have you take us through these buckets here so as I mentioned, um, and I appreciate you sharing that, Matt, because I have had similar health issues and I feel like my, um, my Hashimoto's actually came from burnout. But again, let me talk about this. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, our vagus nerve, our nervous system has three different stages. So when we are feeling our best and we are happy, this is when we are in our ventral vagal. So that comes down the front of the body, your vagus nerve, when you're in this space. And so I think of that as like forward facing. So you're happy, you're joyful, you're connected. This part of your brain is online. We're making good decisions. And you can see that there is a lot of other things happening inside of us too, like our um, defense responses are down, our immune response is really good, our digestion is really good. This is where we wanna be, but life happens, right? We can't control that. There's always going to be stress and that's okay. So maybe you start to kind of, I think of it as like going up a roller coaster. Something happens at work, you get a new diagnosis of something serious. Your, maybe your child gets a diagnosis of something serious, whatever. There's some sort of stress that starts to happen and you move into fight or flight. And again, you probably know what this feels like. I know for me, like my hands will shake and my throat gets really tight and really dry. And besides that, look at all these other things that are happening. My blood pressure is increasing, my heart rate is increasing, the adrenaline, the cortisol, all of those things. Um, and when you've had too much, so let's say, you know, your boss says something else, you have more responsibilities, or maybe somebody quits, whatever it is, you move into your freeze response. And this is, sounds dramatic, but this is what it is. Like, this is your body preparing for death. It's trying to survive. This is burnout. 
So it's not really a very happy place to be. You might feel trapped, numb, depressed, very helpless. And again, there is a lot of stuff physically that's happening here too. And I also want to say, first of all, this is a very high, high level explanation of this because, you know, we only have so much time, but it's really important for me to teach this to people because you have control over this. And it is normal to go through all of these stages all the time that happens. What's not normal is when you spend too much time in fight or flight or freeze. And there are people who have had significant trauma that are spending a lot of their life in those areas. And when you're there, you can't be happy. You can't be connected. And so what we want to do is um, down here, the social engagement piece where we feel safe and connected to the world, we want to increase our tools to help us be there. So what I work with people on is um, identifying what makes you happy, what feels good, and how do we have more of those moments to increase what we call the window of tolerance so that it takes longer to get into fight or flight or we know when we're going into fight or flight and we can take a step back and do the things that we enjoy. And so maybe that's, you know, playing with your kids and can you, you know, play with your kids when you're, you know, working in a hospital on a 12 hour shift? Probably not, but can you take a breath and look at a video on your phone of your kids playing at the playground with you? You can do that and that will reset you. Um, so you might hear a lot of times about people talking about stimulating their vagus nerve. And this is the science or the neuroscience behind why mindfulness works. And so when I think of this green area, that's where we practice mindfulness. And the more that you do that and the more you work that muscle, the more that your brain can easily get to that place and can manage these fight or flight or freeze emotions a lot easier. I know that was a lot but <laughs> I'm looking at the time. <laughs> well, and, and just to call a little bit of a, a, an audible here, we're, uh, we're about to get into the solutions. So yes. <laughs> let's, let, let's hit the next three slides and then which are the, the solution slides. And then we'll just open it up. If anybody has questions, you can start to hit the Q and a uh, button on zoom and we'll leave a couple minutes for questions. So I'll let you go through the next uh, three slides here. Okay. So let's quickly talk about work-life balance. This is unique for every person, just like what I was just talking about with mindfulness, right, is unique to everybody. Um, I don't have kids, so I'm not looking at a, a picture of my kids on my phone, but everybody is unique and what works for them. And I just want to highlight that because again, when I see a lot of things about burnout, it's like, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. It's different for everybody. That's why I want you to start to think about you and your own nervous system because it is unique and you need to do what works for you. Um, so working can also be self-care. Um, we, especially in this field, when you're really passionate about what you do, Working can be self-care. It's just you don't want to become a workaholic or if your work or your schedule is impacting or overflowing into your personal life and you're noticing that, then it becomes an issue. Great, great slide here. I, I, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you take us through it. I wanted to make sure that I gave you skills to use in the moment because again, I hear a lot of shoulds and I want you to be able to take these things and use them for yourself, teach them to your team. So one thing is working on understanding your own triggers. So knowing what pisses you off, what pushes you over the edge, because you can use those skills, um, as we were talking about, like those mindfulness skills to increase um, your response to that and not automatically reacting to your own triggers. And if you can, um, you know, being able to manage those a little bit better. So for me, if like my team texted me really late at night, which used to happen, um, I had to, I understood that that was me getting pissed off about that. And I also needed to set boundaries, which is at the bottom there, which should probably be at the top, but I knew that I needed to set boundaries. I in Florida, my team was in Denver. They would just text me like random questions. It'd be like nine o'clock here. I'd be on the phone with them. I needed to set a boundary like, no, this is my personal time and I'm not working late. Uh, take breaks. 
rest is not being lazy. Rest can also be productive, which I kind of hate that word, but it is important that we know that resting is okay and we allow ourselves to rest, especially in healthcare when you may be dealing with some really difficult things, you need to take breaks. End of day rituals, I love this because our brains love routine. Have a ritual to let you know that it is the end of the day. Uh, for example, I used to work with a nurse and she used to take her shoes off in the garage, not just for hygiene reasons, but because for her, she was like, I want my work shoes not to come into my house. Like that is totally separate. So have some sort of ritual to let you know that your workday is over. For me, I close my office door because I work from home and I do not go back in there until I'm working again the next day. You can use a container. Um, when I was seeing therapy clients, I actually am holding it now, but I used to hold a crystal and I would imagine like everything that they were telling me was like held by this container. So it could be just something you imagine, or it could be like a Tupperware or something. Have a container for all of the hard things that you deal with during the day. Practice gratitude, not toxic positivity. You get to feel how you feel, but practicing gratitude can change those um, pathways in your brain to, again, um, increase your rest and digest area that I talked about in our nervous system, that green box, you want to increase that. You can do that by practicing gratitude. You can journal three good things that happened today and three good things that are going to happen tomorrow. Celebrate your successes. If possible, put physical distance between you and your clients. So especially if you are a therapist or you're working in healthcare, um, try not to sit next to them because you're absorbing that. Try to sit across from them. Speaking of absorbing, you can also imagine yourself in a bubble. I do this all the time, not even for therapy clients anymore. But that way, I imagine that like a bubble or a force field is around me. And all of the hard things that I'm hearing are bouncing off that bubble. That's not coming into like my heart space. And I'm not imagining that and taking that in. And finally, a time management tool that I find is really helpful. If something takes two minutes or less, just do it right now which is hard for me, I have ADHD, but <laughs> I try because then you get to the end of your day, you have an hour worth of two minute little things built up when if you would have just done them during the day, you could be finished. That was really fast, but I wanted to get through it. Let's, uh, let's move forward into some questions here. I'm just gonna skip ahead. And on the question slide, you've got, uh, we have, uh, all of Gabrielle's contact information and you can even scan the QR code there if uh, you want to get in touch for more information or maybe some consulting or, or programs for your organization. But uh, we do have a, a question from the audience. It's a good one here. So um, how do you recommend approaching a leader when plates get too full and uh, then they're not very understanding uh, because they don't have a work-life balance. So what can somebody do about that? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. That is a good question. And it is difficult, right? Because they're also probably, they might even be getting other, you know, productivity or quota things that they need to hit from above them. But uh, you need to advocate for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. And you also, I find that sometimes we also think like, this person isn't being supportive or they don't know, but you're not advocating for yourself or you might not be communicating it clearly. And you want to make sure that you do that again, because nobody is a mind reader. Um, so I would be very clear about um, your job responsibilities and your job duties, because making sure if they're, if they're giving you things that are not part of your duties, that you ask if those can be delegated to somebody else and sticking to your guns. So what helps me is like making a list of this is what's too much for me. This is what's not helpful for me. Um, and doing that in a way, again, where you're advocating for yourself, making sure that things are within your job responsibilities. And I think just being honest and clear, like it's too much and this is impacting my mental health or my physical health or my family or my ability to do my job well. If you find that they're still not listening to you, um, you know, there's always options there. 
whether it be going to somebody else on the team or really just considering if that is a good fit for you. Well, thank you for answering that one. And then uh, final question here. Uh, I've got a question for you. Um, you know, I, I know you work with uh, different organizations around this topic and, and other topics. So, uh, how do you how do you help organizations around these topics of burnout, stress, and and, and other uh, uh, you know areas where you consult? Yeah. So, what we do is we often do a lot of training. So, kind of what I talked about today, but a lot deeper. Um, we map our nervous systems, which I kind of briefly talked about, but how I was explaining, noticing how you go each through each of those stages, I make everybody do that so that they have a clear understanding of what they react to and what they respond to. Um, and then we'll also assess and look at, you know, any attrition or turnover. And we do a lot of deep work on changes that need to happen to usually make the workplace um, safer and more trauma informed. And then we'll do a lot of work again on some of those skills that I talked about um, to help in the moment and those coping skills. And I also do retreats that go a lot deeper into those as well. Awesome. Well, I know we're at the end of the hour. So Gabby, just want to thank you so much for presenting today. And, and Brooke, thanks for helping behind the scenes. And then uh, thank you to everybody who joined uh, and attended our event today. We'll have uh, more webinars in the future, so have a, a lookout for those. So everybody have a, a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye.